Wow, that's a quiet crowd. Um, thanks, everybody, for coming out uh, on this warm Jan or early February day. Um, I'm really pleased to uh, be starting the spring semester's events with this book talk by Jane Gallup. Uh, and uh, we've got a great semester ahead of us. So uh, check it out on our website. And also, a couple things before I introduce Jane. Um, we'll have a reception afterwards on the ninth floor, and so please join us for, for further conversation and conviviality there. And also, uh, if for those of you who are interested, we've got uh, books outside, and I'm sure Jane would be happy to sign them for you. So, um, it's always... Well, it is a cliche to say that you know people need no introduction, and especially a colleague like Jane, uh, who's been uh, a fixture really at UWM uh, for decades, um, does need no introduction. But I thought I would do something anyway. It's a little.
Scholars as diverse and as influential as Jack Halberstam, Lee Edelman, and Elizabeth Freeman, to name just three, have brought the resistance to normativity and the valuation of alternative lives that characterize queer theory to bear on various aspects of temporality. A queer angle on temporality has obvious relevance for aging, which is all about temporality, which is literally the lived experience of temporality. Yet although theorists of queer temporality have focused on childhood and adolescence, and despite the obvious relevance, there is virtually no work applying queer temporality to aging adults. The concept of temporalities in my subtitle arose from the application of all this wonderful theorizing of queer time to the question of adult aging. The subtitle's inclusion of the phallus, on the other hand, is, I imagine, more surprising, more troubling, and needs more explanation. This is especially true because the notion has fallen out of favor in the last 20 years of theorizing sexuality. As someone who, decades ago, contributed to the feminist critique of the psychoanalytic concept of the phallus, I was surprised to find the term suggesting itself as I worked on this project. On the basis of the work I was doing, I came to believe that the reintroduction of the notion of the phallus, denatured by three decades of queer theory, has a substantial contribution to make to our theorization of sexuality as lived in and over time. I thus found myself returning to texts by Sigmund Freud, Jacques Lacan, and Judith Butler to craft a usable notion of the phallus with emphasis on its temporalities and with application beyond androcentrism. In this exploration of a viable phallus, Butler's 1992 article on the lesbian phallus in particular points in a valuable direction not taken up in queer theory since then. In psychoanalytic theory, the phallus is conceptually inseparable from castration. This makes the phallus an essentially temporal concept. The phallus is what one had in the past but lost, or what one has in the present but fears losing in the future. This is the normative temporality of the phallus, that the phallus has been or will be lost that the phallus is imbued with pastness, whether in the present or in the future. This overwhelming pastness of the phallus, its insistent connection to loss, even when it is present, is what we call psychoanalytically castration anxiety. Both late onset disability and aging are experienced as threats to one's sexuality and to one's gender regardless of the gender with which one identifies. This sense of impending loss, a loss tangling together gender and sexuality, can best be understood, I propose, as a form of castration anxiety. The psychoanalytic notion of castration anxiety is thus useful for thinking about how aging and late onset disability are lived sexually. In the standard narrative we call castration anxiety, once the phallus is lost, it is lost forever. In addition to outlining this normative temporality, my book explores other temporalities of the phallus, alternatives to the lose it once and for all normative temporality, alternatives to the phallus's insistent relegation to the past. In addition to articulating the phallus as a temporal concept in its traditional psychoanalytic formulation, this book tracks alternative temporalities where one could move from castration to phallus as well as in the other direction, where the lost phallus is surprisingly regained or where the phallus might appear not only in the past but as a promising future. These alternatives participate in the promise of queer temporality and may even lead to queer phalluses and less anxious castrations. The temporality of castration anxiety 
is the scenario of an impending future losing it once and for all. As it turns out, this is the prospect we find over and over, both in late onset disability and in midlife <laughs> aging. This is the temporality that Margaret Morgan Roth Gallet, scholar of midlife aging, calls the decline story. Connecting Gallet's decline story to the psychoanalytic notion of castration anxiety is central to the theoretical underpinnings of my new book. In her 1997 book, Declining to Decline, Gallet fleshes out the concept of the decline story by telling about the debilitating back pain that befell her at age 49. Her story is a good example of my book's particular focus, a disability whose onset arises in midlife, an experience that can be equally understood as either disability or aging. Although, as a scholar of aging, Gallette understands her experience through the rubric of aging. She writes of what this late onset disability means to her. I had been a strong, active woman. What a wonderful thing to be. I was proud of my strength, and the things that enabled me to do gave me a lot of pleasure. That is what I lost. When you can't do what you once liked to do, whatever that is, you fear, fear you're becoming a different person. This fear you're becoming a different person is what I would call castration anxiety. She goes to see an orthopedic surgeon who tells her, you're not an old woman. But you have to be careful. You can't do the things you did when you were young. The visit to this doctor leaves her in a state of abject loss. It took me only a few hours to figure out that I had just gotten the worst news of my personal life, she writes. I extrapolated from the nerve pain I had been feeling. Whenever that began to worsen, my workday would gradually shorten. I would slowly become disabled and dependent. I was plunged into planning my suicide. The doctor pronounces, you can't do the things you did when you were young. The patient hears that, imagines a future of progressive decline, and is plunged into planning her suicide. Gallette's book teaches us that such moments of entrance into catastrophic loss typify our culture's construction of aging. Gallette is lucky enough to consult another doctor who gives her a different story about the same diagnosis. This second story allows her some distance from the decline story the first doctor pronounced. In her life and in her work, Gallette devotes herself to declining to decline, to resisting the cultural dominance of the decline story. The chapter on her midlife back pain ends thus. Chronic suffering takes different forms. If we ever begin to listen, the sufferers will have a lot of alternative stories to tell. Inexorability doesn't express the way our waves of knowledge come to us, the way we discover our private response at the same time we endure what feels like bodily injustice. In my new book, I join Gallette in listening to these alternative stories, stories that can provide alternatives to what she here calls inexorability, which is another name for the decline story, which I recognize as another name for the standard temporality of castration. By drawing together the various temporalities of castration encountered in these alternative stories, my book lays out a vision of sexuality that is insistently temporal, and a temporal sexuality that is not normatively tragic, but multi-directional, holding open the possibilities of queer phallic surprises and post-castratory delights for older and less able adults. The texts I consider in the book span a range from literary fiction to academic theory. In my search for alternative stories, I pay special attention to writing from critical aging studies and crypt theory that combines personal memoir with critical theorizing, a combination I've elsewhere called anecdotal theory. Gallette's inclusion of her personal story in her academic critique of decline is an example of this from aging studies. The alternative stories I discuss in the next section of this talk are examples from Crip theory. The rest of what I will present to you today consists of two sections from the book. Both sections are from a larger chapter entitled High Heels and Wheelchairs. As you might imagine from the title, the chapter focuses on mobility issues, 
more specifically on issues around walking and prosthetic apparatuses. The first section I will present here is entitled Gender and Disability. The second is entitled The Phallus and the Wheelchair. Eli Clare's Exile and Pride, first published in 1999, one of the first books to combine queer and disability perspectives, is now a classic text of crip theory. Clare teaches us to think the intersection of gender and disability. The mannerisms that help define gender, Clare writes, the ways in which people walk, swing their hips, take up space with their bodies, are all based upon how non-disabled people move. A woman who walks with crutches does not walk like a woman. A man who uses a wheelchair does not move like a man. The construction of gender depends not only upon the male body and female body, but also upon the non-disabled body. For my chapter, High Heels and Wheelchairs, I am, of course, particularly interested in Claire's focus on gender and walking. Claire's the ways in which people walk, swing their hips, makes me think of Riva Lehrer talking about walking and the norms of femininity in her wonderful 2012 text, Golem Girl Gets Lucky. She should sway with a spine strung in a sinuous rosary of bones, writes Lehrer. She should undulate with a hide and seek of the hips and the breasts. In Lehrer's sense of the disabled body's exclusion from gender norms, she notes how her viewpoint is at odds with a certain feminist idea. Women's studies has taught us to see the damage caused by rigid gendering, but there is a different kind of confusion and hurt. I don't know what that is. There's a different kind of confusion and hurt caused by its absence when it's clear that you're not being included because you've been disqualified. Disabled women must continually claim their gender in the face of active erasure. Claire and Lair give enough of their personal stories in their writing that we know both are lifelong non-normative walkers. Their experience as thus excluded from gender norms results in a particularly valuable reconsideration of gender, especially because both are deeply familiar with feminist theory. Both recognize the truth of the feminist critique of rigid gendering, but insist on amplifying and alter altering that from the perspective of disabled gender trouble. As valuable as Claire and Lair are for explicating the relation between gender and normative walking, their temporality is not the one I'm concerned with here. For my purposes, I'm drawn to a group of writers whose crip gender trouble comes upon them in adult life, wreaking havoc upon their already formed gender identities. I will here cite three of these writers not only because they display the temporality of late onset disability, but also because the gender identities threatened by their disabilities are not male female, but butch femme, queer gender. In a 1992 collection of butch femme writings, I found Mary Frances Platt talking about wheelchair use and femme identity. As lives go, mine changed, she writes slowly at first and then more dramatically, recurring back pain and limited range of motion. Soon after came decreased mobility. I began to use a three-wheeled power chair. The more disabled I became, the more I mourned the ways my sexual femme self had manifested through the non-disabled me. Let us note the temporality of Platt's story. Her life changed, a slow decline ending in a wheelchair. Platt entitles her little essay, Reclaiming Femme Again, because she frames her difficulty claiming femme identity after disability as a repetition of an earlier difficulty. The 70s brand of white feminism had me trimming my nails and cutting off my hair. Soon I was outfitted in farmer jeans and high tops. Eventually, I pulled the pieces of my being back together and proclaimed boldly, I am a working class lesbian femme. So I had maybe six years of unleashing my seductive femme self when, as lives go, mine changed. Fighting against the loss of femme identity because of her disability feels like a repetition of her fight against the 70s feminist rejection of that identity. 
I identify with Platt's relation to 70s feminism, and even more with her mourning her femme self. But what I love most about her essay is the sexy twist that she gives to the image of the wheelchair. I hang out more with the sexual outlaws now, you know, the motorcycle lesbians who see wheels and chrome between your legs as something exciting. Mm -hmm. <laughs> An essay published seven years later in a collection of lesbian writing on disability tells a familiar story of femme identity threatened by disability. Like Platt, Sharon Waxler has chronic fatigue immune dysfunction syndrome, but Waxler also has multiple chemical sensitivity. She feels a similar threat to her femme identity, but not because of mobility issues. When I lost the markers of femme identity, she writes, I missed them terribly and wondered if I was still femme. One of the most upsetting losses was makeup, specifically lipstick. Waxler's loss throws her into a struggle with gender identity. It is this loss that threatens gender identity that I am here calling castration. While classic psychoanalytic theory believes castration is the loss of masculinity, this lesbian femme writing suggests that one can also experience the loss of femininity as castration. In her essay, Waxler prefaces her own dilemma with a story of another lesbian confronting disability. A year before her own fall into what she calls the deep, murky waters of illness and disability, Waxler attends the monthly Femme Butch Rap at the Gay and Lesbian Health Center. I remember one woman in particular with soft red hair, Waxler recounts. She said she had a disability and it made her question her identity as Butch. Wasn't the Butch supposed to be the doer? The one who says, let me get that for you, honey? I remember thinking, I guess that's not a problem if you're Femme. That last line is ironic because this recollection is the lead into the problems disability poses for Waxler's femme identity. But that's not a problem if your femme is also true if by that we mean the relation between disability and being the doer. While both butches and femmes experience castration anxiety in response to disability, our particular anxieties point to gender differentiated ways of being phallic. Classic psychoanalytic theory proposes that masculinity has to do with having the phallus, whereas femininity with being the phallus. Our reading of lesbian writing here might revise that as, while femmes are phallic because of how they look, butches are phallic because of what they do. A particularly moving account of butch confrontation with disability appeared in the 2003 special issue of the queer theory journal GLQ on disability studies. This remarkable text certainly echoes Waxler's redheaded butch in her sense that the butch is the doer. But where Waxler's butch does chivalrous things like, get that for you, honey, in S. Naomi Finkelstein's text, the butch is doing is explicitly and graphically sexual. How can I be a butch without my hands, she writes. How can I fuck when my muscles shudder as a result? One of the worst things by far is that I cannot feel the nerves in her cunt or asshole as I used to. I cannot move deftly enough over her clit. I cannot bend my neck to eat her out or rim her. The issue of GLQ where Finkelstein's text appears is entitled Desiree Disability. I love this title for its promise of bringing desire to the place of disability. No text in the rich double-length special issue does this better than Finkelstein's. I am tempted to quote way too much. The opening is flat out sexy. She is lying on my bed, ass up. Jesus, I love her ass. She has opened herself for me. That interjected Jesus speaks from the place of Finkelstein's desire. After two pages of hardcore description of sexual activity, Disability makes its unwelcome entrance. If it is possible to fuck her as hard as we both want, then I'm doing just that. My arm is at an angle that my neck, with three bone spurs going into my vertebra, does not like. My body starts to shake. My arm and then my hand go numb. I'm still fucking her, but I cannot feel the smooth inside of her anymore, and my neck is screaming in anguish. Finkelstein nonetheless succeeds in making her femme come. 
My back is in a spasm, but I ignore it. I finish fucking her through gritted teeth. She comes. She finishes. After describing in some detail the physical manifestations of her femme's orgasm, she writes, in my mind's eye, my own cock explodes as she comes. I get that much pleasure from her climax. In my mind's eye, my own cock explodes, she writes. This is surely in part why, in my attempt to understand queer modes of the phallus, I so value Finkelstein. Despite the detailed account of the butch's pain, the episode is sexy to read, with the exception of the final paragraph. Here's how the story ends. While she rests, I go into the bathroom to take a mu muscle relaxant into the kitchen to get an ice bag. The next day, I have to go to the emergency room for Toradol, a major anti-inflammatory that leaves me unable to eat for two days because it makes me nauseous and gives me the runs. But it does take the swelling down. The ending of her story is literally anticlimactic, but the ending of the story is not the end of Finkelstein's text. Powerful as it is, the anecdote only takes up about a quarter of the text. The rest is not narrative, but thoughts about her life as a crip butch, which includes not only candor about her disability, but also insistence on her ongoing sexuality, on her persistent desire. Like Platt and Waxler, Finkelstein experiences her disability as a threat to her gender identity. But probably because her identity is butch, not femme, it is easier to hear that threat as castration. How is a butch supposed to stay butch when her body is not cooperating? I have felt emasculated by my disease. As I try to think through the temporalities of castration here, tracing the ways that adult onset disability affects the phallus, Finkelstein's text is particularly valuable to me. Like Platt, Finkelstein experiences the threat disability poses to her gender identity as a repetition. Platt, Titling her essay, Reclaiming Femme Again, frames disability's threat to her identity as a repetition of the 70s feminist rejection of femme. Finkelstein connects disability's threat to society's disapproval of butch women. I have paid many a price for being butch. Hell, I have almost been killed more than once for being a butch. I have lived with all these sanctions and stayed a butch because of my fierce love for women, my need to be inside them. But how can I be a butch without my hands? After all I have lived through and endured, I face losing the capacity to be butch. Damn, that has to be a bad joke. I'm interested in the temporality suggested by both Platt and Finkelstein. In their accounts, disability's threat to gender is a repetition. They experienced a similar threat long before disability ever appeared. And their experience of the threat as a repetition allows them, in the face of disability, to, as Platt puts it, reclaim their gender again. Both Platt and Finkelstein end their texts by proclaiming their desire. Finkelstein ends, nothing that they did or that has happened, not the streets or abuse or being a crip has killed it. My desire is still intact. The beauty of desire in all its rawness and untamed hope still leaves my throat scratchy and dry, and it's the taste of glory. Platt ends, now my femme is rising again. This lesbian femme with disabilities is wise, wild, wet, and wanting. I read rising again as the mark of a certain phallic temporality, one that manifests as repetition. These stories of lesbian gender and adult onset disability are stories of castration, but the temporality is not one where castration, when it happens, is once and for all. It is where the phallus is lost and then regained more than once in a repetition, rising again. Platt, Waxler, and Finkelstein all tell stories of late onset disability as castration. All end by affirming the persistence of their desire. I want to contrast this phallic temporality with the standard one, where castration, when it occurs, is once and for all. in the wheelchair. While the previous section of my talk, 
presents texts with alternative sexual temporalities. I chose the text for this section because, because it is such a clear and familiar version of normative phallic temporality. And because it is quite explicitly and pointedly, because it quite explicitly and pointedly articulates disability with the phallus. <clears throat> if the wheelchair is, in our culture, the very icon of disability, the wheelchair is most famously linked to castration in D.H. Lawrence's Lady Chatterley's Lover. In that 1928 novel, Lord Chatterley in his wheelchair is the castrated foil to the phallic hero Mellers. Lady Charlie's Lover gives us a particularly readable version of the standard castration narrative for adult onset disability. The novel displays a sort of symptomatic overemphasis on Clifford Chatterley's wheeled mobility devices, manifest, for example, in its repeating the same sentence almost verbatim in two succeeding chapters. In chapter one, he could wheel himself about in a wheeled chair, and he had a bath chair with a small motor attachment so he could drive himself slowly around the garden and into the park. And in chapter two, he could wheel himself about in a wheeled chair, and he had a sort of bath chair with a motor attachment in which he could puff slowly around the park. Lady Chatterley's lover works to ensure that when we think of Lord Chatterley, we think of him in a wheelchair. I want to return to Lawrence's novel a veritable treasure trove of aggressively normative sexuality. <laughs> Returning to that novel, I discover an emphasis on temporality. For example, chapter two ends thus. Time went on. Whatever happened, nothing happened. Time went on as the clock does, half past eight instead of half past seven. Exploring the temporal dimensions in Chatterley will allow me to formulate the normative temporality of the phallus and will help outline alternative phallic temporalities. Lady Chatterley's Lover is a celebration of the most normative version of phallic sexuality. When the female protagonist gives herself to the phallic man, she of course becomes pregnant. When she rejects her husband because of his war injury, it is widely and repeatedly said that it is because he cannot give her a child. Although scandalous in 1928 for its explicit sexual scenes, this novel is a peon to the superiority of reproductive sexuality. It is a definite pleasure for me to juxtapose Lady Chatterley's normative phallus with the alternative queer phalluses I have found in lesbian writing. The novel's phallic hero Mellers, in fact, expresses a particular animus for lesbians. It's astonishing, Mellers says, how lesbian women are, consciously or unconsciously. Seems to me they're nearly all lesbian. I could kill them. When I'm with a woman who's really lesbian, I fairly howl in my soul, wanting to kill her. Comments like this make me glad to locate the phallus in S. Naomi Finkelstein's lesbian Crip Butch Mind's Eye instead of in Mellers, who militates here and throughout the novel for the most normative reproductive sexuality in the name of the phallus. I admit to a bit of a revenge urge in relation to Lady Chatterley's lover. <laughs> I read that book as a teenage girl in the 1960s trying to keep up with the sexual revolution. This was supposed to be liberating sexuality and it made me feel completely inadequate. I was, to my horror, like all the women Mellers hated, not so much literally consciously lesbian as not properly complementarily responsive to his celebrated phallic thrusts. It was only many decades later, finding myself in a wheelchair, that I thought of returning to the book to look at Lord Chatterley to wonder how his disability figured in this expression of normative sexuality. When I did return to the book, I found not only the normative view of disability as castration, but an emphatic sense of castration as a temporal mode. The novel opens thus. Ours is essentially a tragic age. The cataclysm has happened. We are among the ruins. This was more or less Constance Chatterley's position the war had brought the roof down over her head. 
We might recognize this as the classic modernist sense of the effect of the Great War. It is also what I am calling classic castration temporality. This is where the novel locates its heroine and its reader before it introduces any characters or action. Soon enough, it becomes clear that while the tragedy, the cataclysm, seems general in the opening sentences, it specifically refers to what happened to Constance Chatterley's husband. In the very next paragraph, we read, she married Clifford Chatterley in 1917. Then he went back to Flanders to be shipped over to England again, more or less in bits. The lower half of his body from the hips down, paralyzed forever, crippled forever, knowing that he could never have any children, Clifford came home. Paralyzed forever, crippled forever. Forever is the temporal mode here. Its other expression is the never, of never have any children. Because of his war injury, Clifford is a husband who cannot be a father. The effect of this on Lady Chatterley and in the view of the book is a generalized sense that ours is essentially a tragic age. When the narrator says, we are among the ruins, the ruins are a generalized extrapolation from Clifford, who is more or less in bits. As an aside, let me just remark that why a paraplegic is understood to be more or less in bits is itself noteworthy. Not at all literal, but a striking figure. In bits is the opposite of whole. I would connect it to the Lacanian body in bits and pieces, which in Lacan's theory is the opposite of the body that can assume an upright position, the opposite of the body that can stand without assistance. Whatever we might think of Lawrence's sense of Laura Chatterley is more or less in bits, I want here to pursue the temporality of the novel's opening, the tragic age, the cataclysm has happened, paralyzed forever, crippled forever. This sense of general tragedy of forever that we find in the very first paragraphs of Lady Chatterley's Lover is what Margaret Gallette calls a decline story. To exemplify the decline story, Gallette quotes Ger Gerald Early writing about his state of mind after a gallstone operation. I knew then at that inexorable moment that I had become finally and forever middle-aged inexorable moment, finally and forever. These are the markers of Gallet's decline story, the markers of tragedy of what I'm here calling conventional castration temporality. Gallet discusses decline in relation to the entrance to middle age, an entrance understood as a tragic fall. Clifford Chatterley is, however, only 27 when paralyzed from the hips down. His story is not about aging, but about the loss of the ability to walk, to be upright, and to father children. While these are arguably two different mod modalities of loss, my point here is that they are confronted through the same temporality, the temporality of finally and forever, of the inexorable moment. Like the entrance to middle age, adult onset disability is framed through the dramatic temporality of forever. While middle age and disability might be two different modalities of loss, Many people, in fact, experience them entangled together. Gallette's own personal story, for example, is of a back injury and the onset of chronic back pain as heralding her entry into middle age. Although Fingelstein categorizes her loss as disability, middle aging enters her account as well. That is the difference between me as a butch at 30 and me as a butch at nearly 40, she writes in her vivid account of becoming a crip butch. On the other hand, while Jared Gerald Early categorizes his loss as entry into middle age, he is actually describing an experience of illness and hospitalization. It is the insistent entanglement of disability and loss of youth that indeed characterizes what Gallette calls the decline story, the dominance of a certain temporality. A third strand in this tangle, I would add, is the loss of sexual potency, attractiveness, sexuality, i.e., castration. In her struggle against decline ideology, Gallette does not allow Early's story to remain in that inexorable temporality. She, applies, she supplies the needed corrective. In time, Early returned to health, teaching, and a prestigious writing career, Gallette writes. Although he doesn't mention such things, he goes on to show that he did not remain utterly despairing. It would probably have been truer for him to write I felt for that agonizing moment that middle age was going to be a tragedy forever. I was wrong. 
Just as Gallant insists that Gerard Early actually had a diverse and full life after his dramatically declared inexorable moment, I want to return to Clifford Chatterley to consider what his life was like after his tragic loss. In particular, I want to look at his sexuality after paralysis. I want to look at how the novel describes the sexuality of the man in the wheelchair. In the last chapter of the novel, after his wife has left him, after she is pregnant by Mellers, thus after the inexorable has run its course, we find Lord Chatterley in the care of Mrs. Bolton. Their relationship has become increasingly sexual, although the novel shows nothing but contempt for this perverse sexuality. I take the liberty of quoting at some length. He would have, oh, sorry, I missed something. He would hold her hand and rest his head on her breast, and when she once lightly kissed him, he said, yes, do kiss me, do kiss me. And when she sponged his great blonde body, he would say the same, do kiss me, and she would lightly kiss his body anywhere, half in mockery. And he lay with a queer, blank face like a child. It was sheer relaxation on his part, letting go all his manhood and sinking back to a childish position that was really perverse. And then he would put his hand into her bosom and feel her breasts and kiss them in exaltation, the exaltation of perversity, of being a child when he was a man. The narrator expresses strong disapproval, really perverse, the exaltation of perversity. The disapproval issues from the perspective of normative sexuality. It is not that this isn't sexual, it is that this is a childish sexuality. What Freud, by the time Lawrence's writing, had famously called infantile sexuality, contrasting it with adult reproductive sexuality. In the early 20th century, Freud had established the correlation between perverse and infantile sexuality, and that is indeed what we see her here from the perspective of the narrator's disgust. It is not that Clifford Chatterley has no sex life, but that his sex life is not normal. I'm interested in the exaltation here, the word twice repeated and also bodied forth in all those exclamation points where the text, when the text quotes the excited Chatterley, yes, do kiss me. Exaltation, the state or feeling of intense, often excessive exhilaration and well-being, rapture, elation, Exaltation and euphoria both involve a sense of extreme personal well-being, but exaltation is the stronger and more elevated term. Exalt, from Latin exaltare, to lift up from ex up plus altus high. Exaltation connotes intense pleasure, but with an emphasis on verticality. That uplift is particularly interesting in relation to a man in a wheelchair, unable to stand. It is also, I would suggest, phallic. I find this passage sexy. Maybe it's just me, but I don't think that I'm the only one. Consider Mrs. Bolton having her breasts felt and kissing his great blonde body anywhere, only half in mockery. Mrs. Bolton was both thrilled and ashamed. She both loved and hated it, and they drew into a closer physical intimacy, an intimacy of perversity. Although the novel portrays her as ambivalent, both sides of her response, thrilled and ashamed, suggest that she recognized this as sexual and responds sexually. Clifford Chatterley's narrative arc begins with his castration in the Great War and seems to continue as an inexorable decline. As the novel progresses, he loses more and more, fulfilling the loss inevitable from the beginning as his wife grows distant from him cuckolds him and leaves to have a child by another man. But this late scene with Mrs. Bolton suggests a different phallic temporality, one where the lost phallus can return in another place. What returns is not the normative phallus, the one belonging to a man, not a child, not the phallus that can impregnate a woman, but a perverse phallus, one no less exalting. If we release ourselves from the normative hold of reproductive sexuality, we can enter into other phallic temporalities where the inability to walk or get it up or be a man 
does not have to mean castration forever. Where the phallus could rise again, in the wheelchair or in the mind's eye. Thank you. Uh, so I guess if people want to ask questions, make comments, ask, I'll respond. Jane, I wanted to ask you, you um, talk in the book and then you mention at the beginning this phrase, late onset disability, but in, in your talk you kind of put that aside a bit and focus more on castration temporality. And just listening to the talk, it occurs to me that there's almost a chiasma between those two terms, castration temporality, late onset disability, or at the very least there's an inversion in which temporality comes after, in the first phrase, castration temporality, and then temporality late onset comes at the beginning of disability. And I don't have much to make out of that, but I was just struck by the kind of mirroring of with your focus on temporality, so it's like ABBA, and it would, I guess, work the same way if you flipped them. You would have late onset first, temporality at the end. So I don't know if you just want to think of, I mean, are those two phrases, if you, I guess I'd just be interested in you talking a bit about those two phrases or concepts, castration temporality and late onset disability. Okay, I don't have nothing to say about the chiasmus because I don't, I, 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 it's not, I don't feel like... Yeah, I don't care about the chiasm. But let me, let me talk a little bit about, uh, uh, just say some things about temporality and the phallus and temporality and disability. Right. Because late onset is a temporal term, obviously. Right. Um, so two things. I mean, the, the, so the center of this book in some, in some ways is my thinking about temporality. It, that's kind of where it came from. Well, it actually came from finding myself in a wheelchair and things like that, but that was a temporal event too. Um, as I, so I insist on late onset disability that that has a particular kind of temporality. The, if you look at most of the writing about disability, the model of disability, the exemplary disabled person is the person who's disabled from childhood and is disabled all their life. And that, and that disability is understood as so many of our identities are along the model of race. Right. But in fact, the majority of people who will be disabled are people who become disabled in the second half of their life. That's, that's like there are many more disabled people who become disabled in the second half of life than people who are disabled from childhood. And so, I, so I'm interested in adding to our thinking of disability an understanding of temporality and to look at the specific um, phenomenon of what I call late onset disability. Uh, which is really common, and a lot of the theorization of disability based on people who are disabled all their life offer nothing to that. Offer nothing to the experience of people who are not disabled, who share all the fear of disability of all non-disabled people and suddenly find themselves disabled. And the more I thought about it, the more that seemed to have to do with castration where you, you, you basically have this identity and suddenly you have this other identity that you have always seen as threatening and lacking and all of that. And so it seemed to me really useful to start thinking about um, late onset disability as a category. The other thing is, is that the, the, as I started reading work on aging, a whole lot of the fear of aging is actually a fear of disability. So, um, People are afraid that as they become old, they're going to become disabled. And because they have a sense of disabled as castrated, they, they, it, it, they're, they're, they're going to go from being somehow the, the healthy you know, person to the lacking person who doesn't have kind of full humanity. And so, so I, I, I started sort of thinking about that together. <laughs>
as an aside about the phallus is that when I went back with all this thinking about castration and I went back to think about psychoanalytic theory of the phallus, I realized that castration was completely a temporal model. That, that although classic psychoanalysis got stuck in thinking that women were castrated and men weren't, and that therefore there were two kinds of people, phallic people and castrated people, none of that explains castration anxiety. None of it explains how castration actually operates or the phallus, which is that people who are phallic are always afraid of not being castrated. And Freud discovered that women think they've been castrated. Castrated means not that you don't have a phallus, but that you had one and lost it. And that therefore the difference between being phallic and being castrated is a temporal di distance difference. It's not the difference between two kinds of people born different ways. It's the difference between two different moments in a life. And that therefore castration and therefore the phallus, because in psychoanalytic theory there is no phallus without castration. The phallus basically exists in this form as the opposite of castration got led astray by people trying to think of it in relation to you know, a very, a very old-fashioned view of gender in which there were two kinds of people who were born differently and one was you know, lacking and one was not. Uh, but that, none of that explained the real concept of the phallus as it operates in psychoanalytic theory, which is in the form of castration anxiety or in the form of women who are angry because they were phallus, phallic, but it got taken away from them, that this, this idea of castration, which is there in psychoanalytic theory for all genders. And so as I started thinking about it, I started thinking nobody has really stressed this temporality. And so then they get stuck into this moment that phallus and castration has to do with two different kinds of people, which doesn't make any sense at all of the psychological realities of the relation to castration that psychoanalysis is about. So I guess just to reframe it, I guess my question is whether all late onset disability takes the form of a castration temporality, or whether there are other kinds of, you know, that's, I guess, what I'm interested in. Is that a kind of necessary connection, or are there other forms of late onset disability, forms of temporality that it can take, or does it have to sort of go through castration temporality to something else? Well, well what, what, so what I'm trying to say in the book is, I, I don't know about, you know, empirically whether every person who becomes disabled in midlife no, experiences castration yeah. anxiety. I do know that through my reading and my own personal experience, it's very widespread. Mm -hmm. So let's say, and that, and that it's a very useful way to think about a lot of anxiety people feel about suddenly becoming uh, disabled, having been not disabled. And that it, it very much connects to images we have in our culture of disabled people as castrated, right? Which, you know, people don't, admit to because it's not at all correct. But when they feel themselves going from dis non-disabled to disabled, they feel that anxiety. Um, but what I was trying to say is, what I'm trying to say in this book is that there is not just one castration temporality. There are lots of castration temporalities. And that's what I was trying to find kind of textually through these different stories I'm finding. So classic Freudian castration temporality is you have the phallus, you lose it, and it's gone forever. And that's, you know, that, so like little girls at some point are castrated in that. And then, they'd like, and then they, they, they'll never get it back. And men who are still feel phallic are afraid they're going to lose it. What I, what I found, in the, and so one of the examples is this kind of rep repetition I'm looking at in the butch femme disabled writing. I found a lot of different temporalities in which somebody could feel castrated and then feel phallic again, and then feel castrated again. But th that that there's th so that what what I'm I'm not I'm not trying to argue that there's a way to avoid castration. What I'm trying to argue is that there's that th that the lived experience of castration or of disability or of aging or of the phallus is not this one temporal model in which you have it, you lose it, and it's gone forever. But it's a lot of different temporal models. Jane, thank you so much. Um, this, I think, is a very unfair question. I am enthralled by the question of the temporality of the phallus, but I'm also just wondering if you think about queer spatiality at all. 
about the spatiality of the phallus, no. or whether queer space interests you. I never you. think about space, only time. Okay. <laughs> Sorry, I know you think about space all no, the time. No, it's okay. It's just when I, when, when I read Freud and I, and I read that essay about the uncanny, I find it as much spatial as it is temporal. But that's for another day, perhaps. Yeah. Yeah. I don't think you can I, have I, temporality I think, without I mean, space. I said about space, but I, I mean, I, I think because I got interested in this, this project starts in temporality and it starts in aging and it starts in all of that. And so, yeah, it's, I don't really have anything interesting this thing to say about space in this. I'm sorry. Oh, thank you. Yeah. Drew. Drew. Hi, Jane. <laughs> I, don't have, I don't have this thought through. Something reminds me. Oh, this all reminds me of a Facebook group I just joined um, about aging trans men. Uh huh. Um, and everything there is a decline story. Um, it's just like every narrative that comes up is about this, what you're describing. Something, something's coming up for me um, about perversity, feeling backwards, nostalgia, and the relationship between butch, cisgender lesbians, and trans men. Um, and I don't have it worked through. There's just something coming up for me about it. So I'm wondering if you could talk about um, your decision to go with queer and not as much, and I don't know, I've only read half the book, unfortunately, um, your book, and not so much like trans theory, whatever that might be. Or maybe the relationship between the two. Um, and I, I'm seeing so much of this through my own experience that maybe it's just too close for me, this queer, this nostalgic, this butch lesbian, this trans man. Why, why not trans theory? Why queer? Well, to start. well, partly is the, it, it was the sets of, of writings about disability and butch femme that, that kind of helped me think about this. And so literally I found it. But, I, but, I, but if I think about why, I mean, aside from the fact that there is just a longer tradition, that these are older texts. These are texts from the 90s. And so they were already familiar with me when I started on this project a long time ago. Um, but I think it had to do with the fact that I wanted to try to, to uh, displace gender from male-female onto something else, onto butch femme, which, and, and show the same thing going on, show this stuff about castration going on, but without it being located male female whereas i felt like to talk about trans i would have having to think about more about masculinity and femininity and so i kind of wanted to to operate i wanted to kind of because castration has such a history of being connected to the difference between men and women i wanted to kind of displace with it onto the terms butch femme if that makes sense Although I have to say I have a lot of time. I mean, I spent a lot of time thinking about, well, like, because there's a, there's a lot of, I'll, I'll say one more thing, thinking about how some of the stuff I do in the book, actually in the second half, half of the book, <laughs> that um, relates to trans, because I, I ultimately moved toward making an argument for what I call longitudinal identity, which is to say identities that change over time. And, and so I was thinking about the discourse of trans is, is, is that you, you go from one thing to another, and then that's once and forever, and you found the real thing, rather than imagining, you know, and other models in which you, you're, you, you have changes over time, and that, that's, that, that identity changes over time. Um, and so I, I thought that it would be interesting to think about the, what I call longitudinal identity at the end of the book in relation to discourse about trans, but um, I, don't, I don't do that. Yeah. You. <laughs> Thank you. Um, I'm not very familiar with those uh, literature, but I through what uh, you cited and talk about those texts, I find it's very there are very strong um, commonality that is very strong desire still exists, although the body. And couldn't uh, perform what the mind wanted to desire. I was wondering, are there also texts um, um, talk about uh, you, you still have able body, but somehow the desire started to disappear and uh, the, the other, other way around and the implication for uh, understanding one's identity and uh, sexuality in that case. I wonder if you have come across some text and also have thought about the, that. Really. 
Well, I didn't case. write about any such texts and haven't really didn't really think about. Um, so, I mean, such a thing where, where basically the body re remains able, but the sexuality is gone. I mean, I think I was, um, I, I mean, I went about it in a really different direction. And was, was, so I, I don't really have anything to say about that. Yeah, Greg. Do I have to use the... I don't know. It's, I'm not in charge. <laughs> <laughs> um, th thanks for a wonderful talk, Jane. Um, I have a very personal relationship to this topic because my father was disabled at the prime of life. He was a, a skier, a man about town, quite a woman's man, even though he was married at the time. And um, I know that um, as, a, as, a, as a boy growing up, I was very aware that he did experience, on the one hand, this tragic, right, um, inversion of his life. But that masculinity for him, I think, um, as for, for many men, had always been invested in a range of activities, not just his sexuality. He was a phallic skier. He was a phallic actor. He was pretty much phallic in everything that, <laughs> that he did. And while, while I know he experienced they hit to his sexuality as, as tragic in some ways. I also noticed how displaced his phallic power became. Um, he became an incredibly successful businessman where the game of winning right, became a, a temporality in which over and over and over he was remasculinized in his own, in his own eyes, right? Um, and so I just, I just wanted to comment on this um, large range of activities in which the phallus happens, right? And that these post-disabling lives become lives in which the dissemination of the phallus across these various registers often becomes very, very evident and, and very intense. Thank you. I, I, ha I have just a couple different comments on it. I guess the first is, is that when I told your brother Paul about the book I was working on, he immediately started talking about his father, your father. So, <laughs> so I've actually heard the story about your father before this, this, this material brings that up. Um, that's the first thing. The second thing is, is that Lord Chatterley became a very good businessman mm -hmm. through the book, and he had not been, he had been a, like a, a writer. <laughs> um, so, so, so that's kind of there in the book, although it's not something that I write about. And then the other thing is, and I don't know how to, I mean, I, I, it's not to disagree at all with what you're saying, but, but because I'm, you know, seizing on the idea of, of castration as a way of talking about that, I, although I talk a lot about sexuality because it's a, something that I think through, um, I don't think that like as I was describing Margaret Gillette and her story of of like her back pain all of a sudden and, and all of that, I mean, it was castration, but it wasn't sexual, and yet it was absolutely castration and about that. So that 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 it it would be a mistake, and it would certainly be n not any understanding of of Freud to assume that the thousand and castration were only about sexual activity rather than about a, a much larger sense of uh, self or identity. I'll just say that it also gives me a new way of thinking about his anger towards my mother um, throughout our, I mean, eventually, you know, they separated. But it was clear, even when you were young, that he seemed to be blaming her, right, for getting his polio. And so that displacement seems also to be part of a castration logic. I had never really thought about yeah. that before. So I'll have to go away and talk to Paul about it. <laughs> yeah, Christy. Well, I don't know. I guess I'm just, I think this is fairly obvious, but it's very interesting to me. First, I love your book, which I can't wait to finish your book. Um, but um, I love your argument. and. Um, but to think about this, uh, you know, the beginning, the opening of Lady Chatterley's Lover, which is the age is in decline, our age is in decline, uh, if it's opening work. But thinking about the, the sort of 
the way that the narrative of decline is the horror story of modernity. And because that, and that, so the progress narrative, the scariest thing about it is decline, right? So to see, to think of that much broader narrative as, you know, that, that kind of informs all the way down to the self through business capitalism is, is interesting to think of it as a castration narrative. Um, and the way that generates and reruns all the sort of power, uh, moves in, in, um, in European cultures, I guess, uh, modern culture. So I don't know if you've thought about the. No, I think, I mean, I think it's, I'm, I'm, I'm kind of with you. And I, and for me, it was given me by the opening page of Lady Charlie's Lover, which, yeah. you know, I mean, I decided to read it because I remembered Lord Charlie was in a wheelchair, but I didn't remember, I certainly didn't remember the opening page. And then it was kind of extraordinary, you know, ours is a tragic age, life is in the ruins. And then like two paragraphs later, because Clifford Chatterley was hurt in the war, right? I mean, like, you know, that, that the, the self and then the world and the way that, castration anxiety is not just about the self, but it gets kind of blown into this kind of projection like that the whole world is in ruins. Yeah, so I, but I haven't thought more about it. I mean, it is, it's, it's absolutely, you know, it's a kind of, you know, commonplace of modernism, but I, I hadn't thought about it as connection to castration, but, but Lawrence thinks about it in connection to castration because Lawrence, like, is a, is a kind of a phallic thinker. And he's, so it, I think he puts them together in a way that, that just like let me see that. And it multi, I mean, and then think about how that intensifies the fear of castration at the level of the individual and aging and disability. Yeah. You know. yeah. Richard? Yeah, I want to return to the, I've been thinking about the question about trans theory as, as opposed to, or maybe in addition to, the theoretical frameworks that you're using. And, um, and the reason I'm thinking about it is because that long, surprising anecdote that you begin part one with, that final paragraph, that image, can could be read as a trans image, that sort of phallic wheelchair moment that, that you describe. And I just, I have, don't have a lot to say about that, except that I think that it would be interesting for you to think. Which, now, which, which I'm sorry, the shoes, the wheelchair, phallic, ejaculation, anecdote. That oh, that, my anecdote. Your anecdote. <laughs> OK, I thought you meant the actual I started with in the paper. This is in the book, no, not no, in the No, 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 in the book, in the book, <laughs> okay. your anecdote. Right. That final image seems to me could is an image of you as trans, or could be read as an image of you as trans. So I guess I would, it would be interesting if, as you pursued this line of thought, if you pursue this line of thought further, to think about how trans theory would would play in relation to this, because. Um, and especially in relation, perhaps, also to the way you were theorizing the queer palette. Anyway, it wasn't something I had thought about, but the question really um, prompted me to think, yeah, actually, that would be a, there's something, I think, there. So I don't. So since you read the first half of the book, do, do you have a thought about a response yeah. to that? Yeah, it's just that I think that's part of what made me think of that weird Facebook group. Sorry to call them weird, it's just weird. I agree with Richard. That was that came to mind immediately. Yeah, and I feel like, and I, I mean, you know, again, I may not know enough trans theory to. Um, so one of the, one of the things that I didn't say in this talk, because this is the way that I've been giving this public talk since I started working on this book, is that there are there are personal anecdotes. There are two big personal anecdotes about my sex life and disability and aging that that um, organize the book. And um, I think I'm not I'm not sure the thing about that moment is that it's a trans moment, but it's also a transitory trans moment. And I don't know what trans theory I don't does. Uh, I don't know any trans theory that kind of allows for a kind of uh, 
gender fluidity of going back and forth rather than like, you know, changing from one thing to the other and that change being, being a kind of bigger, momentous thing. Um, it's also, I mean, it's interesting to think about because because as opposed to um, to the the, com the trans commonplace of of discovering who you really are and feeling better because you are who you really are, it's a story of of it's the story that I that I I mean to me I identify with um, the stories that I tell told, talked about today of feeling like your disability takes your gender away from you. You don't want to give it up. You, you, what, you, what you're, ha you're, you're losing this thing that you felt very comfortable with that felt like your gender because of something happening. Um, and that's, because I mean, what I tell in the narrative is, is like, you know, having to give up not only high heels, but then skirts because the kind of orthopedic shoes I had to wear looked terrible with skirts. And all of a sudden I was like, you know, wearing jeans all the time. Um, but and that that I don't I don't know what it would be like to think about that in relation to trans theory because it's it's a story of somebody, so, it's not somebody that's that's really weird that's like a castration fantasy I was gonna say somebody taking my gender away from me but there's no buddy there except <laughs> possibly Greg's mother, <laughs> but um, she could probably do it. <laughs> but so it, it I mean it'd be interesting to think about that in relation to the 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 idea that that transforming from one gender to the other would be, you know, is the, the more positive version of finding who you really are and, and, and also choosing it rather than it being against your will in some way. So I don't, I don't know how, where to go with that, but. Anybody else want to say anything? Yeah, Christy. I guess I just would say I really like the, um, what you make it possible to think about by talking about um, alternative sexualities and perversity of intimacy. I mean, as these uh, positive alternatives, that that's in relation to aging studies, I guess, and human life probably, it, it opens to view the difference between the master narrative and the way things actually go, <laughs> you know, the way things actually work out. Um, and, um, and sexuality is kind of ideal um, practice or location for thinking about that and exploding the I'm call, I'll call them master narratives. So I, I yeah, and it's amazing how much I found, I mean, in, in some of the stuff that I read. The second chapter is kind of more on aging. The first chapter is more on disability. But um, that so much of the, of older people's anxiety about their sexuality, like, could actually, and has been by people who work with them, be improved by giving up normative ideas of sexuality. And so, the, I mean, like, I have enormous regret, but it's not too late, that, that there has not been enough connection between aging and queer theory. Because queer theory, I mean, among other things, it just affirms the different. It, af it affirms sexuality in the various forms that it exists. And that it seems to me that that's something that people who work with aging, people who counsel older people, that older people could benefit from. The idea that, that their sexuality is changing could, it would not get through the grid of the binary of either you have normative sexuality or you have nothing, you're castrated, right? And um, so uh, it just, it, it feels, like an extremely um, useful, uh, mm -hmm. fruitful use of the the kind of queer theory theory attach on normativity, and it's it's used very seldom with people who deal with aging. Yeah, um, Jane, I was uh, I'm not sure if this is related to your interest, but I was thinking of. Uh, the eunuch and uh, their, um, you know, sec their sexuality. I mean, they are physically castrated, like right. physically actually castrated, and like how that affects their sexuality. And uh, I was thinking of that. It's yeah, it's really interesting. And I, I mean, I don't, I didn't read anything about eunuchs. I don't know anything about eunuchs. I mean, except what kind of general know. But I think it's really interesting because again, I mean. I mean, it seems to me that it's 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 perhaps more like Lord Chatterley's sexuality, which is that I mean, we think of eunuchs 
as castrated and therefore not having any sexuality. Whereas there's a like, eunuchs have a life, and they have a life with you know desire and pleasure, right? And so it's it's you know it's again it's opening up. Well, what happens after castration? It's not just nothingness in the void. It's life. Oh, thank you. Okay, well, maybe we should. That's a good place right. to end. Go up and yeah. Yeah. drink. Let's go have uh, <laughs> some libation. <laughs> thank you.